Good morning, everybody, and welcome to King's Church Frodsham Online. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. And for those of you who are regulars and coming back, um, it is so wonderful to be able to share this Sunday morning with you. Coming up, we will ha- be having worship. We'll be celebrating uh, the second s- Sunday in Advent, and we'll be having a preach from Pastor Mansell as well. Uh, and I've got some great news for you. Next Saturday, the 12th of December, we are hosting a Christmas event. We are going to be journeying to the manger. Uh, we, will be, we will be starting uh, by being welcomed by the angel Gabriel. We will be toasting marshmallows uh, with the shepherds. We will be uh, making crowns uh, to take pictures as king. We'll be grabbing a cup of tea or coffee uh, and we'll be then grabbing a sparkler to walk down to the manger to visit the baby Jesus. This is all happening uh, next Saturday as I said at the 12th of December um, between 4 and 6 p.m. Uh, There is a doodle link uh, to sign up for a time slot to start the journey uh, on our Facebook page. Yeah, please just sign up. It would be absolutely wonderful to see you there in person. And what a brilliant way to begin uh, the Christmas festivities by actually spending time focusing on the baby Jesus. I'm going to just pray for us this morning to kick off our service. Father God, thank you so much that you are here with us. That although we cannot gather in person at the moment, actually you are entering the homes of each each one of us, Lord Jesus. You are still present. You are still with us. You are still our forever King. Lord Jesus, we just praise and worship you. Lord, just guide our hearts and minds to just love you more today. Lord, these things we pray in your name. Amen. Make sure that at the end you check us out on Facebook. If you have anything at all you'd like to talk to us about, there's always somebody to pick up the phone um, or just uh, give us a message in some form. It would be great to hear from you. All All our love and blessings. Good morning. Last week we celebrated the start of Advent that time of year when we as Christians remember and prepare for the coming of God's Messiah. Our theme, if you remember, was that of hope. This week our focus is love, and in particular God's love for us. And what I would like to do is to read a poem I wrote some time ago based upon this great theme of God's love. This is called The Power of Love. I could sooner stem the waterfall, the river in its flow, or keep the hungry lion from its prey. To lift the mountain from its base is easier, I know, than to stop this love of God so rampant and so free from pouring down upon me every day. For the avalanche to still its fall, for the sun to lose its warmth, for eternity to reach its final hour, Sooner will the east wind lose its icy blast, but I'll never reach the end of the blessings that he sends. For this love of God will never lose its power. Should the oceans lose their might, could the Arctic ice caps thaw, can the planet's orbit cease to dance? Will the wonder of the universe lose its great appeal, no matter what tomorrow brings? I can know without a doubt, God's love will thrive in every circumstance. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us.
This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me And I Good morning. Our reading is taken from John chapter 1. We're reading verses 1 to 5 and then 14 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. In the opening chapter of his Gospel, reading from verse 14, John writes, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And then he goes on to say, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And as I reflected on these words, I found myself asking, so what did John see? I mean, what was it about the life and ministry of Jesus that so captivated John and led him to become a, a lifelong follower of Jesus and produced in him the conviction that he must write down what he saw? Look with me at the opening verse of his Gospel. And there John writes, In the beginning was the words." And the Word was with God, that is distinct from God, and the Word was God. And what verse 14 and the verses following on from there make clear is that Jesus is the Word, that, that he is God. And what is interesting here is where John starts, where for him the story begins. You see, Matthew starts his Gospel, his story, with a genealogy, the, the human ancestry of Jesus. Mark begins with the baptism of Jesus, while Luke begins with the birth of John the Baptist. All three of these gospel writers then begin their stories from an earthly perspective. Their starting point is the humanity of Jesus. For John, however, his starting point is the divinity of Jesus. And then look at verse 3. Uh, through him, through, through the word, through Jesus, all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. It is because of him, Jesus, that everything exists. Now, he is the life giver. Uh, all life derives from him. So in Psalm 19.1 we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And, and on the same theme, the hymn writer, David Mansell, writes, 
Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. For by his power, each tree and flower was planned and made. Jesus is Lord. The universe declares it. Sun and moon and stars in heaven cry, Jesus is Lord. And then in verse 4, John says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The point that uh, John is making is that it's only through the word do we truly see, only through Jesus do we encounter truth, that which really is. And so the glory that John saw then was that this Jesus whom he kind of hung around with for three years was none other than God himself in flesh. That, that he was also the creator of all things and the source of all life and truth. John then goes on in the latter half of verse 14 to, to speak of Jesus as one full of grace and truth. And, and here perhaps we are reminded of the story John tells later in his gospel of the woman caught in adultery. And, and those amazing immortal words, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And as each accuser walks away, the, the, the glare of truth revealing their utter hypocrisy Jesus is left alone with the woman. The irony here, of course, is that uh, of all those who are gathered there, it is, it is Jesus who is the only one who had the right to cast the first stone. And yet, he says to the woman, is there no one here to accuse you? Then neither do I. Now go and sin no more. Jesus' glory is that he was full of grace and truth, Truth that is willing to confront sin and grace that is willing to forgive sin. And in forgiving her sin, Jesus does not condone what she has done. For he knows that it was for sinners like this woman that he had come and that the required punishment for such sin would be paid by himself upon the cross on that first Good Friday. And it is surely here upon the cross where, where Jesus' glory is most evidenced. And so John recalls Jesus' words to his disciples. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Unless a grain of wheat dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. And what does John witness at the cross? That even there, Jesus is thinking not of himself, and his own sufferings, but of his mother, whom he entrusts into John's care. A brief survey then of some of what John saw, a, a, a kind of short snapshot of John's story. So what about you then? What, what's, what's your story? Believer, skeptic, or atheist this morning, we all have a story. We all believe in something. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, writes in one of his letters, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. The other day I found myself wondering what I might say to someone if, in the midst of a conversation I was having with them, they asked me, so, Mance, why, why do you believe in God? What's your story? Now, of course, there are a number of ways that you could I could tackle that question, but as I, as I mulled it over in my mind, I was reminded of what, in Methodist circles, is called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which is based upon four building blocks, reason, experience, scripture, and tradition, and forms the acronym REST, R-E-S-T. Let me then tell my story, why I believe in God, based around these four building blocks. Let's start with tradition. Now, now, tradition is that stuff we do because those before us did it and those before them did it and those before them did it and so on and so on and so on. The kind of stuff that when challenged or even questioned provokes the question, the response, well, we've always done it that way. So in my family, it was kind of tradition as it was with many families when I was a kid to go to church. And that is what we did without fail every Sunday, my brother, myself, and my mom and dad. I didn't go because I believed in a God that loved me, 
and nor did I go because I knew that Jesus had died on a cross for all my wrongdoings. No, I, I went because that is what we did as a family and what mum and dad had done before me. But see, here's the interesting thing. Whilst both my brother and I went to church, if you were to speak to him today, he would say he does not believe in God. For him, the world can be explained without reference to God. Me, I am utterly convinced that God loves me and him and that Jesus died on a cross for all my wrongdoings. My point here is that for me, tradition helped me in that I personally never truly doubted the existence of God, but it did not bring me to what I would call saving faith, to that conviction that I could have a personal relationship with a personal God. So T, tradition. Uh, what about the first letter of our acronym R? Reason. You know, there are many today who would argue that science, the voice of reason, has made belief in God redundant, that Christianity and the findings of modern science are just simply not compatible. The reality, however, is that like science, religion, faith, belief in God is based upon reason, upon examination of the evidence. And so John, near the end of his gospel, makes it clear that what he has written is evidence upon which faith in Christ can be based. Just hear what he says. Uh, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And for scientists like Francis Collins, uh, the man responsible for mapping our human DNA, good science leads to faith. Faith in a personal and noble God, faith that is highly rational, reasonable, and based on evidence. My faith in God is not some leap in the dark. When I became a Christian, I did not become some mindless, unthinking moron. For me, the more I look at the wonders of creation and listen to those who explain its mind-blowing complexities, the more unthinkable it is that I am a random being in a random and godless universe. But perhaps more than this, when I am confronted with an empty tomb that days before had the dead body of Jesus laid in it, and I'm told by reliable witnesses that Jesus appeared to them, I am confronted with the startling truth that Jesus is alive and present with me today. Tradition, reason, thirdly, experience. I've been a Christian now for 40 years, so it's not just tradition and reason that point me to the existence of God, my experience tells me as well. To hear the still, small voice of God tell me that he had not finished with me yet when all I wanted to do was to quit being a pastor, to, to sit in a room with three boys when doctors had given my wife three reasons why we could not have children, and to recall the prophetic words of Pastor Dave, who said to Tracy that she would increase. To reflect upon the innumerable answers to prayer and to know that God both hears my prayers and answers them according to his purposes. To hear the stories of lives radically changed and to know personally some of those people. To wake up each morning with a hope in my heart. To, to know that whatever lies ahead of me each day, Jesus is with me and will guide and instruct me. All this unquestionably points me to the existence of a merciful, loving and just God. One who has a plan for my life, one who accepts me as I am and gives my life meaning and purpose. Tradition, reason, experience and last but not least, scripture. Of the four in the, this Wesleyan quadrilateral, this is the most important which is why we call the scriptures the Holy Bible. Holy not because it is some ancient relic that needs preserving in a glass cabinet, but holy because it is unique, a book like no other, a book that through the ministry of God's Spirit speaks to us today. Indeed, it is 40 books penned by, no, it's not, it's 60, 66 books penned by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years, written in three different languages, 
and yet whose coherent message throughout is that God loves us. It is the story of God. It is his story, inspired by him, uh, and that comes to us through the agency of man to lead and equip all who seek after God. And so the Apostle Paul writes, all scripture, all of this, is God-breathed, literally breathed out by God, and is useful for teaching, uh, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And lest we are prone to doubt or question the validity and authenticity of this great book, it is worth remembering that the New Testament has more manuscripts and earlier manuscripts to support its accuracy than any other piece of classical literature with close to 6,000 Greek New Testament manuscripts and around 20,000 in other languages. So reason, experience, scripture and tradition, the acronym REST. Why do I believe in God? What's my story? Because all four point me in different ways to one unassailable conclusion, that God is. And like John, though not in the same way as John, I have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Father, I thank you this morning that uh, the truth is that we all have a story. But I thank you that for me, that story um, began some 40 years ago when you met me, when you came into my life and when you changed me forever. And I thank you that you continue to change, you continue to transform, and you continue to give me hope. And I pray that uh, any watching this morning uh, who is uncertain, perhaps doubting, uh, questioning, uh, they might know too and have that same assurance that God is and that God is love and that he loves each one of us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. to 
prosper. You have not forgotten us. You are with us in the fire and the flood. You are faithful forever, perfect in love. You are so. Forever, perfect in love. 